Okay, we're on. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, a chat with um, Deputy Chief uh, Billy Goldfeder from the Loveland Sims Fire Department in Ohio, very well known and well respected uh, author and lecturer in the fire service. Um, Chief Goldfeder is a member of the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation Board of Directors and was just recently awarded the prestigious Mason Langford Fire Service Leadership Award. So without further ado, yeah, claps for Chief Goldfeder for that accomplishment. Uh, I'm gonna pass it off to Chief Goldfeder. Hey, thanks, John, and thanks uh, for hosting this today on World Book Day. Of course, we all knew it was World Book Day well before you told us that. <clears throat> and, uh, but this is just a, a chance. Now, I, I do want to apologize. Uh, in the Pass It On book series, uh, over the three books, we had 180 contributors to the books. And so we have successfully pissed off 175 of them today <laughs> because uh, <clears throat> I was talking to my best buddy, Steve Pegram, yesterday, and he says, what about me? I said, dude, next time. We'll get you on next time. But uh, I just picked some people that I think, uh, uh, and, and Amy helped me, that uh, we, we, we felt had a message to share. And uh, if this is successful, <clears throat> there has been talk about perhaps uh, on a regular basis, featuring different people who wrote in the book and let them share their stories live. And uh, so uh, thanks to all of you that have bought the book. We have raised literally tens of thousands of dollars for the, uh, the uh, Chief Ray Downey Scholarship, the uh, National uh, Fallen Firefighters Foundation, and of course, the Firefighter Cancer Support Network. Um, with me today are some just wonderful people. Uh, of course, John Tippett, who uh, introduced us. Uh, John is the retired uh, Deputy Fire Chief of Charleston, South Carolina, a retired Battalion Chief from Montgomery County, Maryland, and a uh, contributor to the book. Uh, Chief Frank Lieb is the, uh, Frank, are you Deputy or Deputy Assistant? Uh, deputy Assistant. <clears throat> okay, and so for those that are not familiar with the hierarchy at FDNY, where does that fit in, starting with chief of department and, and work your way down? Where does the deputy assistant fit in, chief? So the chief of department, chief of operations, um, typically they're one and two, and then uh, assistant chief, and then deputy assistant chief, and then uh, deputy chief. I see. So your rank falls between deputy and assistant chief. That's correct. I see. Very good. And Frank is uh, the chief of the FDNY Fire Academy. Uh, he's very active on social media, does a lot of writing for uh, not only the magazines, but WNYF. Uh, and uh, I would describe Frank as not only a friend, but he's into the job. And those of you that like to use that term, uh, one, of our, uh, uh, one of our most favorite people who is watching us today from heaven, uh, Joey DiBernardo, uh, would always say, are you on the job? Or are you into the job? And Frank Lieb is definitely into the job. Uh, not only is he at the FDNY, but he also is a uh, past captain and active firefighter out in East Farmingdale in Long Island and Suffolk County as well. Next is uh, Chief D. Uh, that's the best way to describe him. Uh, as a young, young firefighter, I would hear rumors about this guy up in the Bronx and you don't want to cross him. And I said, I want to be like a chief like that. I want to be a tough chief because the tough chief takes care of their people. And there's no question that Chief D, Chief D Bernardo, his reputation is known world, worldwide as a man who took care of his people. And of course, uh, Chief D is the father of the late Lieutenant Joey D Bernardo, uh, who lost his life on the, at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Black Sunday fire. Uh, but Chief D uh, in being the way he is, continues not only to mourn the loss of his son, but he lives his son's life by managing and leading the Joey D. Bernardo Foundation. And Chief D can share with you all the good that that foundation has done in the name of his son. Uh, so those of you, uh, especially, you may see Frank around, you may see Sarah around, I'll get to Sarah in just a minute, you may see John, but those of you who join us today, you're in for a rare chief to meet Chief D. Bernardo. He's, he's uh, just a stand-up chief, a little bit of a character sometimes, uh, but somebody that, uh, what, what a pleasure to have him on board and, and a pleasure to call him my friend. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Sarah Jackie, 
Uh, I met Sarah when she was a very young girl, uh, honestly, at the funeral of Don Mano. Many of you who are a little older remember Don Mano from the National Fire Academy. Uh, Donnie passed away, and uh, they asked me, Jack McAfish, Rich Marinucci, and I think John Buckman to speak at his funeral, and it turned out to be like a comedy routine. Uh, I don't know that I ever had that much fun at a funeral, but that's how Donnie would have wanted it. And uh, Dr. Sarah Janke, while not a firefighter, she has done more for the fire service than most firefighters and fire officers have done by her research, her love for the fire service. Uh, she's a very active member and advisor to the International Association of Fire Chiefs, Safety, Health and Survival Section. And Sarah's mission, you know, many of us wear the stickers, we have the hats and all, everyone goes home. Sarah is the, one of those behind the scenes people that are making sure that we can learn on how we can go home. So I wanna welcome all of you to join us today. And again, the intent of today is to have a discussion, uh, not only to share a little bit about what you wrote in the book, and we're encouraging everybody to please uh, purchase the book. I know thousands of you have so far. Um, maybe a little bit of background. Where did the book idea come from? Well, Bobby Halton and our friends at Fire Engineering for years had asked me to write a book. And I, uh, to be honest with you, I, I never really had any great desire to do so. Uh, I, and do you really need another book on how to throw a ladder or stretch a line? And I, you know, I gave it some thought. I was certainly honored that I was asked to do that, but what, do I, what am I gonna offer that, that isn't already out there? And I mean, I got a lot of opinion stuff, but that doesn't make a book. So <clears throat> I gave it some thought and I was on an airplane and I was reading Esquire magazine. And in Esquire every month, they feature someone who's well known and the, the column is called What I Know. And I was reading Robert De Niro's column and it was basically him giving advice to people. And boom, I said, this is it. This is the book we're going to do. And that's where the Pass It On book one, two, and three came from. Pass It On one was insanely uh, uh, popular. Um, and, 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 and as Harry Carter says, he says, Bill, you didn't really write a book. You got a hundred of your best friends to write it for you. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, what an op, you know, you're never going to be able to meet in, in many cases, the majority of the fire service will never meet Chief D, will never meet for, uh, Chief Lieb, will never meet Sarah, uh, unless you're at a conference and of course after this past year, who knows, right? But the book gave you an opportunity to hear personally from them. I mean, uh, uh, Chuck and, and, and Joe Downey uh, gave us Ray's handwritten notes to his son to put in the book. I mean, where are you gonna see stuff like that? Where are you gonna learn that? So that's what the Pass It On books are. Uh, they're a fun book to read. Uh, they were put together with ADD, ADHD, firefighters in mind. The chapters are very short and there's a lot of pictures. So that will retain most firefighters. Uh, we could not have, uh, attach a centerfold because that, this is not the seventies anymore. We're, modern and we're focused and, and, and treating people properly these days, right? But it's, it's just been an amazing experience. Uh, we are done. Uh, we did all three and we're done. Uh, that uh, Mel Brooks said, get off the stage before they start booing you. So we got off the stage and, and now the three books are out there. And again, I encourage you uh, to purchase those books. Uh, many fire departments have bought them for graduating classes. Uh, we have departments that every year the probies all get a copy of, of one of the books with the expectation that they buy the others. So anyway, without rambling on much more, I encourage you and to look 30% off the bundle or 30% each individual copy. Thanks to uh, Fire Engineering Books for doing that. Uh, FDIC, Bobby Halton and that bunch for uh, providing a, a wonderful opportunity for people to save some money. But please buy the books, give them as gifts. Uh, and the only thing I would suggest other than that, uh, if, if you're going to give a gift or you want to do something in somebody's name, is the Joey D. Bernardo seminar series. You can go to the website uh, and check out what they do. Consider going to those seminars. If you've never been to Long Island, it's a great opportunity for you to go out and, and, and see some great speakers, uh, to meet Chief D. himself and many of the others, and support a very, very important cause that's near and dear to Chief D., and I'm sure he'll talk about that. And the other place you can put your money is the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. I make it my business whenever a dear friend passes away or a loved one of a friend uh, that I buy a brick in their name. And uh, so that's, that's one way that you can uh, spend your money as well. But please consider these books. 
uh, I promise you, you will not be disappointed. And with that said, let's get started with our discussion and, and let's start with Chief D, um, <clears throat> who uh, I, I, I'm so thrilled he could join us today. And I'm thrilled those of you who've joined us with, uh, joined us on this call can hear from Chief D. Bernardo. So Chief, a little bit about yourself, if there's maybe one person who doesn't know who you are on this call, and then tell us about what you wrote in the book. And of course, uh, we would love for you to share the story of Joey uh, so everybody knows who he is, uh, what he did, and what you're doing to carry on his memory. Chief D. Bernardo, welcome. Thank you. For, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Billy, uh, for all you do for the fire service across America with your close calls and your books. And you're just fantastic the way you pay it forward. On, and believe it or not, you... And you know, it, you save many lives just by your instructions, your close calls information and your books. I'd like to thank John Tippett up there at the National Fallen Firefighters Association for all they do for firefighters across this country. Dr. Janke and Chief Lieb, your research into firefighters' cancer, firefighters' health, firefighters' well-being, is saving lives. And um, that's something in the background that, you know, because of your research and your work, you're saving firefighters' lives. I unfortunately came into the job when uh, it was macho to, we didn't wear masks because th th they judge the fireman by how bad he can take a feed. The better feed you can take, the better the fireman you were. What we year did you come on, Chief? Uh, I came on, I was called in 65, but I was uh, in a place called Vietnam at the time. So I got appointed in, in, in 66. So as soon okay, as I thanks, got home Jeff. from Vietnam, I went from the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> uh, I could tell you stories about that, but that's another day. But anyway, thank you guys for bringing to our attention how stupid we were, you know, by not wearing a mask, by not cleaning our clothes, and, uh, and as a result of that, most of my friends are no longer with us. They're gone, they're dead from cancer. And Chief Lieb and I were discussing this and I think the only reason some of us are still here is because of genetics. Because the Bob Farrell, the legendary Bob Farrell never wore a mask and he went through all the war years and never wore a mask. And I was part of that stupid generation because when you worked in the South Bronx, if you, you wore a mask, you were looked down upon. So I went with the flow like an idiot and wound up with terrible headaches and throwing my guts up. So that's, so who am I, what am I? I was appointed at FDNY in 66. I made Lieutenant in the seventies. I was very blessed and lucky because I went up to the South Bronx during the heyday, uh, 1976 alone. And I talk about this in, in my, part of the book and like I don't consider myself an expert I've had got a little experience and I always say like my first little paragraph that says beware the expert I rely on the experts like in the rescue disciplines when I go to a building collapse when I've gone to building collapses the guys from rescue the guys I rely on they have the knowledge if the, the chief might say one thing but the rescue officer's got the knowledge he's the expert he's the guy I rely on and he's the guy I look to. 76, we had 153,000 structural fire in the city. 153,000 when I was a lieutenant in the Bronx. And let me tell you, it was more like 175,000 because in those days, we didn't have computers. We didn't have electric typewriters. We had the Underwood and the Royals. So if you had a structural fire, you had to go back and type out a structural firefighter report. And there's nothing that the lieutenant and the captain hated more than was typing a report out. But we, if, it was a, if it was an outside rubbish fire, it was a one-line entry, okay? So a lot of times we'd have a job that so busy, the chiefs didn't even get into the job. So the lieutenant and the captain, we had one room going in the vacant, you know? Boom, we stretched one line, put it out. You know what? We made it outside rubbish one-line entry, so we did put it down. We didn't have to type out a structural fire report. Well, we probably had 175,000 structural firefighters in 1976. But 
So, and I was a lieutenant in the Bronx, and I was a firefighter in Harlem, firefighter in the Upper East Side, made lieutenant in the Bronx, worked was UFO in 82 and 31 for a while after the book came out. And oh, I made captain, I said, look, I was a firefighter for 10 years in Manhattan. Don't send me back to Manhattan, send me to Brooklyn. So guess what, they sent me to Manhattan. <laughs> I was a captain on the Lower East Side. And I'll tell you, of all the places I've ever worked in the city of New York, the toughest place to work is Manhattan especially Lower Manhattan and the First Division, because they have every kind of structure in the world. Every fire is different, and every fire is difficult. And the hardest place, was, place to work was Midtown Manhattan and Lower Manhattan. It's, it, it is very difficult. I'd rather work, go to a thousand tenement fires than to go to one office building fire. Office building fires where uh, we was three lines we couldn't make the hallway and the chief would come up and say great job guys you put the fire out and we say take a look chief we don't put the fire out it burnt itself out so, i mean that's a high rise <laughs> but um so i was a captain in lower manhattan then i was made battalion chief i went to bedford stuyvesant and bushwick and while well, i was still burning that was a lot of fun because i went to brownstones and frames row frames is great they're great we used to stop it at the corner well, we'd stop it at the vacant lot where we had the fire last week and there's no more building. Because once it got going in the row frame, it was really going. I, I remember one time I, that we, had a cover, we had a good job, top floor job, and I know it was going east and west. And I had a covering lieutenant there for the day. And he looked at me, I said, skip that building, which was exposure, you would call it D04. I said, skip that building, go in the next building, pull the ceiling, you bring a hook as an officer and stretch a line. He looked at me like I had two heads. Like skip the next building. I said, "Yeah." Sure enough, he went. He skipped the exposure, went to the next building, pulled the ceilings, and just as he got the ceilings down and the line charged, there was the fire. So if he went in the exposure, he would be playing catch up, and we burned that one down to the corner. So anyway, Diane uh, Chief and Bed Stuy and Bushwick, and it was great fun. You guys know Pete Gancy. He was the chief of the department killed on 9/11. He was one of my lieutenants. So, uh, and Jimmy Ellison and all those guys, they were all my lieutenants. So that was fun, it was great fun. And then I made a deputy and I was lucky enough to, uh, there was an opening in the Bronx in 1984. I went up to this, back to the South Bronx and uh, the borough commander was uh, not well liked and him and Vinnie Dunn didn't see eye to eye. And Vinnie Dunn is one of the most knowledgeable, greatest fire chiefs I ever worked with. And I've known Vinnie since he was a captain of 58 engine. And Vinnie was always a very young looking guy. He had just had this young face. And when he made battalion chief, I probably Vinnie's probably watching today. He he just looked like a 16 year old redheaded kid. And uh when he would say, start the water, the guys would go back, start the Wawa? Like, pretty him like a kid. <laughs> then he was the best. But anyway, then he didn't get along with the Bronx Borough Commander, and nobody did. So there was nobody in the Bronx. Everybody was afraid to go to the Bronx, but I wasn't. So I went up there and uh, make a long story <laughs> short, I spent the next 16 years there. And it was still quite busy. I went there in 84. and. It, the fires were in 84 were probably 50% of what they were in 74, but they were still, we've, we've led the world in structural, we led the country in structural firefighting. So it was great, a lot of fun. So that was my, my story as to I, where I worked. And if you would like to speak about the, uh, Billy, what would you like me to talk to about the book? Like well, what I what I really like, you know, uh, to have you join us today is a great opportunity. Um, and really, what one thing I've learned over the last couple of years is don't assume anybody knows what you know. In other words, uh, many of us are very engaged in the fire service, but some who are in the fire service are not overly engaged, like perhaps we are. So I think if, if I was going to ask what the most the best way I could take advantage of your time today are two things. One, I'd like you to tell us about Joey. And secondly, I'd like you to leave us with advice to young firefighters. So that that's, I think if, if I had a wish chief, that would be it. 
Tell tell those speak to speak to the audience as if they do not know who Joey is. Although I'd be surprised, but you know what? Again, we have so many young firefighters on the job now. They may not know, and it's important they understand uh, uh, about the fire and what you've done since then to make a difference. And then leave us with some advice to the young firefighters. How's that, Chief? All right. Uh, well, um, I was lucky that when I was a captain, Joey was like ten or eleven, and, I, and as a captain of a firehouse, I, I took him in on the weekends, and um, he was putting out little rubbish fires with the boost line when he was 10 years old. And then when I made battalion chief, he was riding with me in Brooklyn and I was taking him in and I, after the fire was knocked down and everything, I had him pulling ceilings. I had him at jobs. I had him uh, using a multiversal when he was 13. So he developed this love for the fire service. As a small child, he would play with the little, we made up fire dwellings out of cardboard boxes and he would, we made tapes from the fire department dispatch radio. He would play the tapes and play with the fire engine. It was in his blood. He was destined to be a firefighter. Um, he, he got on the job and he, he just went to every FDIC, every convention. He attended every school. He was, uh, he, he had every rescue discipline. He even went to crane operator school. He did everything. He was so knowledgeable. He was this font of knowledge. He wasn't a studious kid. He wasn't academically smart, but he could tell you what a shovel of dirt weighed. I mean, he was, like you said, he was the fire department. As Jeff Cool would say, Joey was the FDNY. He was, he had a reputation that was unbelievable as a firefighter. As a matter of fact, and he had five years on the job. Captain Ralph Kiso of Rescue 3 said, he's Joe, I'd like to take Joey over into the rescue. And I said, listen, Ralph, that's between you and Joey. I don't want to get involved. Because a lot of chiefs in the jobs would get their sons into the rescue companies, go over the captain's head. I didn't want any part of that. But Joey had such a great reputation that he went in there just as he turned five years in the job. That, that, you know, that's unheard of. You got to be have 10, 15 years in a job to get into the rescue companies. Then Joey was in rescue for like a year or so, and they asked him to teach at the rescue school. He said, Dad, they asked me to teach at the rescue school. I said, well, there, there has to be a reason for that. He said, yeah, but I'm going to be teaching guys with 15 years in a job, and I got five years in a job. I said, Joe, as soon as you open your mouth, they're going to shut up and listen because you have you're a font of knowledge about firefighting. So Joey was, uh, he was the FDNY in, the, in flesh and blood. Okay, so that's a little bit about Joey. What I can, and Joey was into training, 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 training. When they formed the squads, they reformed the squads. Uh, an assistant chief named Eddie Gary, uh, deputy chief named Eddie Gary, he was in charge of the project, who was killed on 9-11, by the way came up and said, Joe, I, I want your son to come over and help me form Squad 61 in the Bronx. I said, well, that's an honor. Uh, he's still in the rotation. They said, that's okay, we'll pull him out of the rotation. We want him in the squad to teach the squad members. So he was even known at headquarters for his knowledge. So he was a plank member of the squad before he went over to the rescue. All right, so let, let me talk about, Joe, he was into training, training, training. He uh, trained the volleys out on Long Island. He trained the professionals in the city. We would make up different scenarios. And he was repelling off uh, water towers when he was like 19 years old as a kid. You know, other kids were out hanging out in the mall and Joey was repelling off water towers. And uh, he was just 100% FDNY. We both went out after 9-11, got FDNY tattoos together. So anyway, Joey was into training. And our idea of training for, for you young people that are listening, and I bring it out in the book. In the service, they have you disassemble your weapon and take it apart, your weapon in the dark, blindfolded. Okay, and do it faster and faster and faster. And why they do this is so in an emergency, when your weapon jams, you don't have to think about it, but you can do it in the dark and pitch dark with your eyes closed. The same thing with the fire service. You can train, train, train on your tools. So 
it becomes second nature. Now, when you have to use tool A, you don't have to stop and think, is it the blue hose or the red hose? You don't have to stop and think, do I do it clockwise or counterclockwise? It's second nature. If you train, 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 it becomes second nature. Seconds count when lives count. If you have ever been in a flashover, you know that seconds count in firefighting. And you, the chemists and the physicists online, they know that a fire doubles in size every 17 seconds. Okay. One of the best drills, and I bring it out in the book, is the man down drill. We had a fire in the city where a, a, a large firefighter was had a, a heart attack in the basement of a private dwelling, and they couldn't get him up the stairs. They struggled and struggled to get him up the stairs. One of the best drills I can teach young firefighters, when I used to go around to firehouses, I would pick the biggest guy, put him in his turnout gear with a mask on, tell him to go lay down in the basement. Then I would have the guys black out their face piece. I would have one guy go down and search for him. As soon as he searched for him, he found him, he gave him May Day. With the May Day, I sent the second firefighter down. And I, this is all timed, by the way. If you're lucky enough that you have a rapid intervention team online, you could send, send them down to, okay, so we would time it. You'd be surprised how long it takes you to get an average size fireman down in his bunker gear with a mask, find them and get them up the stairs. So we used to practice this and practice this. And imagine, and if you're out there and you're listening to me, try it. It's a great point. Train, train, train. Uh, I'll give you another training tip I put in the book um, for company officers and chief officers. I was a young uh, officer in Manhattan and I responded into a working fire and we had a very old tough chief, World War II guy. They called him Black Jack. Black Jack Fogarty, his name was. And I, I zeroed in on him, look, I'm running down the block, I'm looking at the fire blowing out the window. And Fogarty said, turn around, Cap. I said, okay. He said, tell me, where's the fire location? Uh, it's on the fourth floor, chief. I said, uh, he said, how many rooms are there? How many rooms are on fire? What's the color of the smoke? Are there front fire escapes? What are the, what are the exposure? And I went, uh, duh, 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 and I was totally embarrassed. So what it is, is I had, I focused, I didn't see the big picture. I zeroed in on the fire. So that's another learning point. You know, look at the big picture. Don't zero in on the fire coming out the window. And I'll tell you chiefs out there, try it someday. If you're at a fire, have one of your responding officers, you know, if you don't have to immediately put them to work, tell them, turn around. Tell me what's exposure to, what's exposure for? What color is the smoke? You know, the color of the smoke can tell you a lot of things. So that's a good training tip. Uh, another thing, uh, know your response area. A lot of you people out there, 90% of your response here is private dwellings, right? So go into the other 10% of the buildings. Go up on the roof. What's on the roof? You have a large air conditioning unit above that little mom and pop store. In a fire, that's going to come down and kill you. Um, what is the back door? How do you force entry in the back? You know, take a, take a look. Where's the basement entry? Is it behind the counter? Is it in the rear? These are things you can learn Instead of hanging out in the firehouse watching a ball game, go out and know your district, okay? Um, especially today with these lightweight trust buildings, they're killers. My advice to you is stay out of them. In the sixth division, when we started seeing them in the sixth division, we had a fire and there was no floor. So we wrote a circular in the sixth division. Don't go up on the roof blah, 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 and we presented it to headquarters and they didn't publish it. But I tell you what, our sixth division circular was used by New Jersey fire departments. And we had it in our sixth division units. So we are proactive. These lightweight buildings are killers. We also, I went to, uh, as a chief officer and, and who has been to a thousand fires, I went out to Indy. And I watched John Salker talk about saving our own. And we didn't even have this in FDNY, saving our own. We're always talking about saving other people. I recommend everybody, 
attends that seminar on saving your own. I put that, that back to FDNY. I said, look, we got to save our own. We're always saving everybody. We don't save ourselves. Well, what is it, Joe? I, well, you know, you go, you drive, jump down a window, a uh, ladder head first, right? You bail out this way, you do that. He said, well, we can't do that. Somebody will get hurt. I said, well, I, I'd rather somebody gets hurt than killed. So I went to Rescue 3 and we made a video of saving our own. And with Rescue 3, with guys that you know and taught for you. And I went to headquarters and I with the uh, chief of training and the chief of department. I said, look, I have a video here I made of saving your own. Let me see it. Oh, Joe, we can't do this. Guys will get hurt. We'll get sued. I said, give us the video. They said, okay. I said, but I got six more. And every one of my battalions had that video. And they, they passed it around the company. So... You know, you got to be, you got to lead from the front. And then uh, I talked about leadership. You know, you're, and one thing, uh, every time as a division commander, every new lieutenant captain and battalion chief, deputy chief reported into me. And the first words out of my mouth were, you were promoted to serve your men, not to be served by them. And I want you to be the tip of the spear. I want you to lead from the front, especially company officers. You know, don't be on the floor below. Don't be a fire escape barrel arena. You be at the tip of the spear. And believe me, if I found out and if I got the feedback that you were hanging out on the floor below or on the fire escape, you weren't, you didn't stay in my division very long. You were gone. And I had chiefs that come up there that didn't want to be there because of the fire duty. So they didn't stay too long. And if I didn't, if I, listen, I'm not, I'm not meant to be your friend on the fire floor. I'm meant to be your friend at the party, at the retirement party. But on the fire floor, I'm not to be your, I, I don't want to be your friend. I want to save your life. So let me And Chief, that, you know, that, and that was your reputation for, for an outsider. I mean, I was on Long Island and, and our 70s, my busiest year, I went to 65 working fires, which was not bad back you know, for, for a volunteer outfit. Oh. And, uh, but we would hear stories about you and many of the other chiefs and stuff. And, and your reputation was a tough chief. And, and that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, the, the greatest transition we have in our business is when you go from company firefighter to company officer. And if you're in the FDNY, they can move you far, far away and they may not know you as well. So you kind of have a fresh start. But most people who are on this call with us today are in, you know, three, four, five station fire departments. So you're going to still work with the people you get promoted within. And it's very challenging. But your words of wisdom are, are right on. They can't be your friend. Doesn't mean you're mean. It doesn't mean you're nasty. It means you're taking care of you. And that may mean decisions have to be made that you may not like. And, and that's a great, great, great tip, Chief. Billy, one thing I did also, I made it my business to... After everything was said and done and everybody was in position and we go, we went to under control, I would make it my duty to go into the building as a deputy chief and walk up five flights, walk through the smoke and see the first two companies. And I would say to the captain, how are your men? How's everybody doing? And one of my captains was Eddie Kilduff, who wound up chief of the club. You guys know Eddie Kilduff. And he said, oh, we used to love seeing you walking through the smoke. We never see a deputy walking through the smoke. They're all out in the street. You're the only one that ever came up and said, how are you doing? And I would say, how are you guys doing? I showed them I cared them about, about them. I showed that, that I'm not hanging out in the street, guys. I'm in the smoke with you. And I want to relieve you. But most of my companies, I said, how you guys doing? We're doing good, Chief. You want a blow? No, we're good, Chief. Come on, I want you guys to take a blow. No, I had to order them out of the building. The companies in the 6th Division, you had to, they didn't want to take a blow. They, it was their fire from the beginning to end. The point is, you leave from the front. So I went in the smoke, and that was something rare. And that's why I showed you that plaque on the wall, which I'm very proud of. You know, the men knew I cared about them, and you have to you can't lead from the floor below. You have to lead from the tip of the spear and critique every fire. When you get back, hey, what do we do good? What do we do bad? What can we do better? Never stop learning. Never stop reading. Never stop attending. 
show your men that you care for them. Uh, you know, and and um, I I don't know. That's what I think. That's what a good leader does. Keith, People, you you right. also great gave a great piece of advice too. You know, and and this is phenomenal because here you'll get guys in small departments who get frustrated with the hierarchy and the and the the uh, bureaucracy and all that. Well, imagine the hierarchy and the bureaucracy of the FDNY. I mean, this is the, the <laughs> second largest fire department in the world, biggest fire department in North America. So your your point is, I'll never forget this story. You go to headquarters, they don't like it. Okay, fine. I'm going to go back to the area I'm responsible for, and I'm going to see what I can do to make that better. Yes. And I remind that to young lieutenants, don't worry about headquarters. Worry about your engine company. Worry about your truck. Worry about your squad. That, that's a, that's that's phenomenal. Otherwise, yes. you go crazy trying to change the whole thing. Focus on what you can change, and uh, there's usually enough work there to be uh, to be done. That's, yeah, well, that's I'll tell phenomenal. you uh, two quick stories. Quick stories, Billy. Uh, um, in the sixth division, we really really are in a great ship, and uh, uh, I made a lot of changes up there, and. Um, I remember we had a division messenger and his job was to bring stuff around and pick stuff up. And when I went to the sixth division, I said, where's the division messenger? They said, well, he's hanging out in his quarters. I said, well, that, we're putting an end to that. I want him in my office here. And he came in and I said, from now on, you're gonna carry a radio. Every time we go to a job, you're gonna be my eyes in the rear, you know? You know, what a, what a great we, use. Yeah, what a great use of resources, right? You know, most of us, have, we're in the front of the building. We don't know what's going on in the rear. Now I had a guy with a radio in the back. And he was putting, instead of him watching TV in his own quarters, he was now, he was, these were light duty firemen that were injured. He's coming to work with me and he's doing, he's my eyes and ears in the rear. Now the chief of the department named Bobby Butler at that time, you know, if you don't know it, it's not going to hurt you. So everything came through the chain of command and it got to me. I said, okay, let me deal with this. And it didn't go downtown and the problem went away. So one day, Bob Butler, the chief of the department calls me up and we're having a discussion and he's said, he gets mad at me for a reason I won't get into. He said, what are you running your own fire department up there? And my answer to him was, listen, have you gotten anything from the 6th Division that's caused you grief or any problems that you've had to handle? And he said, no, I haven't. He's, I said, so? She so said, keep up the good work. <laughs> Chief, can you, uh, can you um, and, and it's not fair to say briefly, but can you share Joey's story uh, sure. and, and what, 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 What's going on today to continue to honor his memory and all the work he did? Go ahead, Chief. Right. Quickly, we had a fire in the Bronx, and there's nothing. Oh, that's another thing. There's no such thing as a routine fire. Everybody, every fire is different. You never know when it's going to come. The Red Devil's going to come up and bite you in the butt. So don't take anything as routine. Everything is different. Typical tenement Bronx tenement fire. Been to thousands of them. Thousands of them. Nothing's ever routine. This fire in the Bronx, first of all, blizzard, snow, delayed response, blizzard, snow, frozen hydrants. Now you get up to the occupancy. You don't know what the occupancy is. Illegal partitions didn't know that. Illegal partitions cutting off. You don't know if you're hitting the fire, you're not hitting the fire. Four, illegal partitions cut off access to the fire escape. Five, all these things, a perfect storm of everything went against these guys. Rescue and ladder two seven are on the top floor of a, of a four story tenement, five stories in the rear. The fire's traveling up the walls behind these illegal partitions. It's in the walls, quick story, it breaks out of the walls. Six guys are trapped on the top floor, four from ladder two seven, two from rescue three. The, uh, they're trapped, they can't get out. They're hanging out the windows. Now the fire department in its infinite wisdom took away their personal safety ropes to save a few dollars. I can get into that in a minute, but they don't have their personal safety ropes. And that's my part of the book where it says, you don't go to a gunfight with a knife. 
You don't send your firefighters into danger's way without the proper equipment. You don't put a cop on the street in, in middle America, 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 where he's never, no cops ever been shot, but they wear safety vests. But you're sending firefighters there without personal safety systems? Oh, God. So anyway, they're all trapped to hanging out the windows. John Ballou jumps for the fire escape, but because of the partition, he misses it. John had four kids killed on lands five stories below in the recessory at John. At least four kids in a way. The next window is Kurt Myron, Eugene Stolowski, and Brendan Cawley. They're trapped. No safety rope. They lower Lieutenant Eugene and Brendan lower Luke Kurt. Kurt dies, three children and a wife. Eugene lowers Brendan. Brendan's brother died on 9 11. Imagine if he would have died. He was broken up. He, Eugene starts burning up. Eugene jumps out the window, gets hooked up on the child guard, swings him around, he, he lands. Eugene is one of six people in the world that suffered, suffered a decapitation and lived. Eugene's alive today. He's a miracle. We call him Miracle Man. And the next window is Jeff Cool from Rescue 3. Jeff's trapped. But because of the fire, he, he has a safety rope that he bought himself, his own personal safety rope. But because of the fire conditions, he can't tie it off. All he can do is hang out the window. In the next window is Joey DiBernardo in the next room. Jeff sees Joey, says, Joey, I have a rope, but I can't tie it off because of the fire conditions. I'll throw you the rope and save you. Jeff Cool is ready to give his life for Joey DiBernardo. I mean, it doesn't get any braver or better than this, ladies and gentlemen. This is what the brotherhood's all about. Ready to lay your life down for your brother. Jeff says to Joey, I'll throw you the rope, Joey. I'll save you. And Joey says, heck no, Jeff, you got a wife and kids. I don't. No time to argue. Throw me the rope. I'll save you. Jeff throws Joey the rope. Joey wraps it around his body and his arm. Jeff goes out the window. He pendulums when he goes out the window. He loses control. He falls in the side alley. That saved, that 10 feet saved his life. Jeff broke everything. I mean, he, he was in the hospital, almost died. I visited him. His organs were on a table. Jeff was, it's a miracle he lived. And Joey went out, tied it on the child guard. He went out, lost control, fell four stories to the ground. He broke everything below his waist, was in a coma for the whole nine yards, but lived. Okay, so that's the story of not having the right equipment and the story of heroism. These guys were all went through major operations, major surgery, and they lived. They went around the country preaching to all departments across the country, you have to have personal safety systems to save your firefighters' lives. They got the laws changed. They got fire departments, municipal, volunteer combos to get these personal safety systems. Unfortunately, Joey passed away from his injuries. Billy, you know that well. Um, but after Joey passed away, um, guys like John Sorkin, Mike Dugan, Kevin Yost, all those guys came to me, said, we got to do something for Joey. Joey's mission was to save firefighters' lives. We have to continue his mission. So we formed the Lieutenant Joseph P. Bernardo Memorial Foundation. Our goal is that no firefighter should have to jump out a window for lack of a safety rope. Unfortunately, these ropes are quite expensive and the training is quite expensive. So our goal, we, we, we raise money through donations. Guys like Dennis Leary, the actor, Captain Bob Farrell. Um, I just got a wonderful donation from Chris Kyle's father. Chris Kyle, American Sniper, American Valor. They just sent me money. And I got a lot of mom and pops that send me $10, $20, $30. Okay, that's the foundation. We have given out $600,000 to little departments across America that can't afford to buy their own safety systems. That's great. But you know what's even better? We have a seminar every year 
and we have the best trainers in America, and you know them because they've written, they've written in this book. A lot of the guys in this book have come and taught for me. And we teach hundreds of firefighters in everything you can think of. We do live burns. We have a flashover simulator. We have guys rappel down an elevator shaft in a 20-story hospital building. Uh, we're going to do, we do the best people in America teach for us. And then they go home and they take this knowledge and they give it to their firemen. So it's exponential. I can't tell you how many lives we save with our training. I can't tell you how many lives we save with the over a thousand personal safety ropes that we've given out. And that's what we do. Our goal is that everybody goes home. You don't go to a a gunfight with a knife. You don't put your cops on the street without a gun and a vest. You don't put your firefighters in a fire without their personal safety systems. Hey, chiefs out there, union guys, commissioners that are listening, <laughs> save your firefighters' lives. I'd you know, spend a buck, or do you want to give a widow a flag? Because that's the alternative. So I don't know if that's what we're about. The Joey D Foundation, we're about saving firefighters' lives and training firefighters. So that's what we're all about. And I, I don't know if I've done what you wanted me to do, Billy, but I tried. Hey, you did okay, Chief, you know. All right. <laughs> you did fantastic, and I appreciate you so much. You and Mrs. D and Kevin and, and the rest of your crew uh, uh, are making such a difference. Um, and... Uh, do you have the seminar date set for 2021? Yes, Go ahead. Yeah, we always use the first weekend in November. We have our training. Okay. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to even this year, uh, we have our friend out in Te Austin, Texas, uh, Steve Sanguidolci, that's affordable drill towers. It's a great concept. And he, we're even going to do a scaffolding thing this year. You know, when there's window washers or that they're yeah. doing something on the building? We're going to do a scaffolding evolution. I don't think that's been done anywhere in America. Yeah, that would be a that. great, uh, a great training a, evolution. We have an eight-hour elevator class where you actually go down a 15-story elevator shaft. I mean, where do you do that? No. Plus, we have a, a flashover simulator. Now, I know a lot of cities in America don't have a flashover simulator. We do live burns. You know, Vinny Dunn, John Salter, Mike Dugan, uh, Tony Tricarico. Nick Champo, these are all guys I work with. They all teach for us. They, they, you know, we got the best guys in America. I trust we're only this big compared to firehouse and fire engineering, but you know what? We get the best training and the money, we don't take a dime. As a matter of fact, we lay out our own pocket and all this money goes to a good cause and, and uh, you know, support us. You know, if all my friends out there send us 10 bucks, we could probably outfit the... Uh, 20 uh we could probably outfit uh, two or three departments if you just to send us 10 bucks anybody listen today send 10 bucks <laughs> probably you could outfit uh two departments with that 10 bucks that's phenomenal and when when the uh brochure is ready make sure as always you send it to me and i'll make sure it gets out to everybody yes thank you billy thank you for your support over the years and and, and all you guys and uh, you know just thank you and god bless america that's all i could say Thanks for sharing the uh, the story, Chief. And uh, now everybody uh, can know who Joey is, know who you are, and understand that the admission continues from that 10-year-old going to fires. Uh, yeah. From heaven, he is still making a difference. And that's a big deal. And His you know, goal is to teach. So thank you, Chief. You're either on the job, are you on the job, or into the job? Into the job. That's right. And speaking about into the job, someone who's actually not on the job but probably more into the job than many firefighters we know. I want to ask our next uh, presenter, uh, Sarah Janke, to join us. Dr. Sarah, uh, as I mentioned, she's uh, very, very engaged in the fire service. Uh, and uh, she's one of those few that are behind the scenes making huge difference. So Sarah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, and uh, of course, mention your dad, because you know without him, you wouldn't be here. You know how that works, right? And uh, please um, uh, uh, share your story and, and, and what you talked about in the book and your advice to firefighters. And then we'll go to Frank after that. Go ahead, Sarah. 
Well, without him, I wouldn't be here in more ways than one. So exactly. we literally would not be here without him. Um, and I'm a little pissed that you put me on for Chief D because that was uh, that was amazing. So thanks for everything you just shared. And um, and I am a little anxious to go after you because I, to be honest, when I got the email asking me to write a chapter, I thought that no one would want to read that chapter because I don't have the good stories that, that you guys have. And it really was actually one of the hardest things that I've written because it really made me think about kind of like, I have two pages to say what I want to say and, and, and really like why I want to say what I want to say. So um, after a lot of writes and rewrites, it really came down to, um, it did come down to my dad. So I grew up, dad retired when I was in my um, early 20s as chief in Overland Park outside of Kansas City. And around the time he retired, it was, um, it, it, or around the time I started to get into research was the same time he had his first heart attack. And um, and it sucked, like it sucked to sit in the waiting room and with, I'm one of eight kids, so everyone, you know, like obviously rushed to the hospital and we sat through his heart surgery, first heart surgery. Um, subsequently, he's had um, some skin cancer. He's had a couple other health issues and he's, he's doing, he's doing good now, but about, uh, five years next month. So that's where, how, like I, how I got into this, right. As I, like, I saw the impact that being in the fire services ha had had on my dad. And I thought I really want to, um, like make a difference for people that are going into the fire service and if they can be healthier and live longer lives, um, and ha healthier, happier lives. Like that's a, definitely a good thing. But five years ago, I had my son Crosby, who has Down syndrome, and I was so thankful that my dad was there because, like, when I found out when we got the diagnosis before Crosby was born, like, my dad was the biggest champion for Crosby from the minute we found out. I mean, from the, he and he loves all his grandkids. Um, I, for any siblings that are watching this, I think they, I don't want to say Crosby's his favorite, but <laughs> but he. Like he's just had a connection with my dad that no one has ever, it, it, like no one else has that connection with my five-year-old that my dad does. And um, I realized at that point that like Crosby may not remember my dad if he doesn't live long enough. And when I think about that, like in terms of the fire service stuff, like all the health choices along the way and, you know, wearing SCBAs and, and like the sleep impact and all those types of things, like you don't lose everyone. People will tell me like, from the time I started this, people would say like, well, you know, you're, everyone's going to die of something, you know, it's it, so probably being on a job is going to take a couple of years off of my life. Like everyone dies of something, but it really hit me when I was watching Crosby and my dad that like, you don't lose the days that you like are having a flu or you're, you know, 20 and having a shitty day. Like you lose the days at the back end. You, you lose the days of being a grandpa. And like, I, it will break my heart if my dad passes away before Crosby can remember him. And it really kind of invigorated things about five years ago. Cause I thought, I don't, I don't want people to lose their grandpa days. You know, I don't want people to lose like those final days that are really going to make a difference in the next generation. And, and I want I want my dad to be there when Crosby graduates from kindergarten, but we still have another year to get to that. So, so that's where I came from. And um, I think my message to the young firefighters is, yeah, everyone has to die of something, but you don't want that to be sooner than it has to be. And I think you, the, the decisions you make every day in terms of like the health and wellness um, and like prioritizing that and taking care of yourself, like that's what's going to, when you're looking at your grandkid, hoping that they remember you, um, it's the decisions you make today that are going to influence that and decide that. So that's my take home. So when um, <clears throat> Amy Amy Tippett helped me pull the book together and uh, each all three books, and uh, she describes your chapter as the one that made grown men cry, and uh, that's a big deal. Your message is so critical. You know, the cancers and the heart stuff doesn't hit us right away. It's not like you're out on the highway and you get hit by a car or you're operating in a building and you have a collapse where the, you have an immediate response to it. It's the heart issues. It's the, uh, the cancer issues that sort of grab onto us, but we don't know it's grabbing on. 
And as I've, I've as you and I've talked about, and, and you're getting ready to walk your granddaughter or walk your daughter down the aisle, and uh, the day before you go to the bathroom and you're pissing red, red blood, and now your entire life changes, and now is when you wish you wore your mask. So thank you, Sarah. I've had the pleasure to become friends with Crosby. Once you meet him, he's a friend for life, and uh, he's he's one of my honorary six pack members as my six grandkids. He's number seven, and he's a sweet kid, and he's lucky to have you and your husband uh, Nick as uh, parents, and of course your dad. So please send your dad our love, and uh, we appreciate you joining us today. You know, uh, social media is a funny thing. I never got on Facebook because I heard all the horror stories and of, of the negatives and this, and I just, for some reason, it just didn't click. But I am on Twitter and I am on Instagram and I've made some really good friends because of that. I'm not sure that Frank Lieb and I would have crossed paths if it weren't, I mean, probably we would have at some point, but I've really gotten to know Frank, quite frankly, from his tweets and his messages and what he's done at the FDNY and at East Farmingdale as a volley in Long Island. And so I'm thankful while I've not known Frank uh, for many years like others, the last eight or nine years, we've become friends. I follow him, he follows me and Frank and I have become friends and he shares a lot of information with me that I'm able to share out on firefighter close calls and on the secret list. Uh, I have an immediate attraction to anybody who's into the job. Uh, I, sometimes people at the fire department will say, doesn't that person annoy you? Yeah, he's a pain in the ass, but he's into the job. He loves being a firefighter. There's very little that person's going to do to annoy me. And, 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 and so uh, when I think of, of somebody like Frank, here's a guy in the biggest fire department in North America who still, and there's many others, but Frank sets the uh, standard these days as the current modern band of chiefs that are leading the FDNY as someone who's absolutely into the job. And not only does he lead the FDNY Fire Academy, he's a duty chief for the FDNY. Uh, he teaches, he writes. So Frank, please uh, make yourself welcome. Thank you for participating in the book. Uh, and um, it's a pleasure to have somebody who's into the job join us today. Tell us about yourself, Frank, and, and uh, uh, share your message with us today. Thank you, brother. Uh, thanks, Billy. I appreciate it. And thank you for everybody who uh, who put this together. Thank you to um, to everybody who's who's on this call. I mean, Sarah and her team, what they're doing and the research that's saving firefighter lives and all the researchers. Really, when you talk about research, this is the enlightenment era for the fire service. And um, we really have a lot of those folks to to thank, whether it's the folks down in, in Miami, whether it's the folks out uh, in University of Arizona, um, or the folks at, at UL or and Sarah's team. And there's just there's so many people that are doing great work for us. Um, so Sarah, thank you for all that, uh, that you guys do for the fire service for sure. And I am thankful I did not have to follow Chief D. <laughs> I could listen to Chief D speak all day long. The amount of nuggets that he spewed out in his time frame, I would succeed all of my time speaking today to listen to him more. Uh, just an amazing individual, uh, a leader, a role model. Um, you know, I happen to uh, know, I knew his son. I met his son in 1998 um, uh, when we both became members of, uh, of squad companies. I was a charter member of squad 270. His son went up to 61. And actually I knew him before that from, from the days in the volunteer is because he was a teacher for many, many years. So um, he is what every firefighter should be, um, no matter where you are, the FDNY or, or anywhere. He, he is the fire service. Um, and uh, the work that the, the Joey D Foundation and you and your family and, and the friends of him, is just, it's an incredible testament to your son's life and the legacy that you guys have, have gone on to, to do. I know many of the people that you mentioned that are instrumental in doing that. And it's just uh, an honor to be on here and listen to what you have to say. And, um, you know, as uh, Billy mentioned earlier, all the different people who've contributed to this book, and the other books, I love. I love all three of the books. Uh, the the short, concise paragraphs of them, uh, you know, of the of the uh, the short chapters is is fantastic. You have ten minutes, and you could pick up a nice little lesson and share it with members. And uh, it's all about passing it on. It's all about learning. Uh, experiences are transferable. That's one of the things I speak about. 
Um, you went to all those fires and learning. We could learn from those stories and pass them on to, to generations and to other firefighters. Just like going and doing an elevator rescue that you spoke about, 15, uh, 15 stories. That's an experience that you're getting. And you're going to get these other stories that come from that. It's so critical because we simply don't go to enough fires and emergencies today to make it where, um, uh, where we're getting the experience to, to be able to operate. Um, and that's critically important. Today's firefighters want to know the why. Uh, the researchers have given us some of the why. The procedures that, that were written years ago, we're, we're verifying the accuracy of so many of them um, that were written from generations ago as, as we continue to um, really just steward the fire, sh the fire service forward from the giants that came before us. That's kind of our job and, to, and to, to keep us moving forward and keep our members safe. When we talk about um, occupational cancer in the fire service, it doesn't matter if you're a career or if you're a volunteer. It doesn't matter. Pay to volunteer. It does not matter. It, it, does, not, um, it does not discriminate. Uh, and uh, Dr. Jenke spoke about that you, you want, don't want to take off the grandpa days and years. And I would say that I also don't want to take out the days of being a dad. Um, one of my good friends, Ed McDonough, who I was his lieutenant when we were in 324 engine, I convinced him to study because he was one of those guys that got it. He didn't live to see his 50th birthday and left behind, uh, left behind all of his young children. And I think about him often that, you know, his children, his children were still young. They're still, they're not even close to being, he wouldn't, wasn't even close to being a grandpa. So wear your mask. My message certainly to the, to the young firefighters is you got to be your own advocate. You got to make the steps necessary. Take the decisions in your own, in your own hands when it comes to protecting you. You have an SCBA. Everybody has an SCBA today. Wear it, wear it through overhaul. Uh, and make sure you're doing the steps. When you get back, make sure you clean up, you know, take a shower. When you get back to quarters, take a shower, then put the equipment back in service. The Halligan's never going to get cancer, but you may. So genetics does play a big part of this, but we know that we're seeing firefighters get cancer at younger ages, more aggressive cancers, and we can take steps. If this generation of firefighters and leaders don't take the steps necessary, generations from now are going to look back at us and say, what did they do? They were asleep at the wheel. If you're in a leadership position, you owe it to yourself. You owe it to your members to make sure that you're looking out for their health and safety. We do it with everything with our firefighters. We're always looking out for them. We take the keys from them when they're going to be drinking at a company function. We try and keep them out of trouble in so with social media. We're not so good at that, but we try. This is an extension of that. We have to make sure that we're doing all we can to best protect um, our members. And some of the things that the firefighter can do back at the station, obviously wash your hands, take a shower. How about wash the inside of your helmet? And no one even has to see you doing that if, if being safe is uncool for some reason. So take some soap and water and wash the inside of your helmet. Wash your hood when you come back after it's been exposed. Wash your boots. Don't wear your gear around the firehouse. Do not bring your gear in your car unless it's in a gear bag. And if it's in a gear bag, it should be also in a plastic bag inside of it so that we're minimizing the cross-contamination. These are simple steps that don't cost anything to do. And uh, if you do that, maybe you'll live to see more of those dad days and hopefully you'll get to see many, many, many granddad days as well. So the final thing I'm gonna talk about is staying learnable. And that's the theme about uh, in all three of these books, staying learnable, staying knowledgeable on the fire service. When I, went on, when I came into the fire service in New York City in 1992, um, uh, I had a captain who took me on the side and he said, the one thing you wanna do is read something fire service related every day and, and make sure that you learn from everybody around you. Sometimes you're gonna learn good things. Sometimes you're gonna learn what not to do and take a little bit of that every day and make yourself better. That's something that I've done and still do. I read something, many things fire service related almost every single day. Social media has made it easier. There's so many great people that you can, that you can follow on social media and, and get different opinions outside of your own little world. I learn from people both inside my organization and outside my organization, but I stay learnable. Have a beginner's mindset where you are open to new ideas and you're open to the research and that you can bring it back and best apply it to your particular department. One size doesn't fit all. Unless we're talking about some of the stuff that we could do for cancer, in that case it does. 
but stay learnable. Keith D spoke about it, that he's still learning all the things he talks about reading, the, reading all these things. And that is probably the, the one message that, that goes throughout all of this. Read, stay into the job, stay learnable, whether it's fire service uh, research that's going on, how to best protect yourself from cancer or how to do an elevator or scaffolding rescue. And uh, again, thank you for having us today. This was, uh, this was awesome. And again, I could, you got to have one with just Chief D where we just listen to him for hours on end. <laughs> thank you, Frank. And, and uh, the stay learnable, man, that, that just, that's, that's such a great little quote there. Uh, and and you're, you're right. I mean, with, th with this little device, uh, while it's not the end all, you can learn something every day. And, and on the other end of what you were talking about, watch out who you're learning for as well. If you've got a three-year firefighter preaching to you about uh, structural firefighting, you may want to take a step back and, and make sure the people who are talking actually know what they're talking about. But uh, such great advice. Stay learnable. I'm going to remember that and probably put it on a t-shirt and I may or may not give you credit. We'll see. We'll talk about it. So I'd like to wrap it up with John Tippett. Uh, just a, a quick word. Uh, you know, I wrote the introductions to all of the, all of our authors and, and uh, uh, Sarah, Chief D and Frank, uh, I consider good, good friends and people I deeply respect. Uh, and of course, John, uh, who uh, contributed to the last book as well. Uh, Take time to read from these people, as as all uh, as has been mentioned. In ten minutes, you can read a chapter. In five minutes, you can read a chapter and learn. If you do a chapter a day, you're good. Uh, some of it is available. I think it is actually available online now. You can do it through Kindle or whatever else. Is a uh, many ways to read a book today. But my advice is quoting my own boss, uh, Ot Uber, our chief of department, and Ot uses the term a lot, and he calls it "stay in your lane." Stay in your lane, focus on what you're responsible for. Especially in the world of social media today, we tend to worry about everybody else's business. So as Chief D was talking about before, if you can't, you know, you're not gonna change the FDNY, but you may change uh, engine one. You're not gonna change the San Francisco Fire Department necessarily right away, but you may change rescue squad number two if that's your area of responsibility. So stay in your lane, focus on what you can do. What's the best your company can do? And that's what you wanna focus on. And, and, and all, of our, uh, all of our contributors today have talked about that. Do the best you can, uh, constant learning. Uh, and, 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 and as Sarah talked about, think beyond just the fire service. Think about that, that, that kid you may wanna have one day or that grandchild you may wanna have. You wanna be around for them. Uh, I know that's, you know, I'm not old, I'm not young, I'm 65, I'll be 66 this year if I'm lucky, right? And, and I want to be around. Um, I'm thankful that my kids, if I did pass today, would be fine. They'd be fine. But I like to think they'd be better off with me around. And that's kind of, kind of uh, putting the icing on what Sarah was talking about. So, John, let's pass it on to you, a few words of wisdom, and then you can take us home. Well, thanks, Billy. Uh, it's, uh, as, as I had the privilege of writing um, about the privilege of the service, I, today is another example of why this vocation career um, is truly a privilege to be a part of. And I think it brings home all of the points from Chief D to Sarah to Frank about the obligation you have of being best to yourself, to your brothers and sisters in the service, and to your family uh, because of the privilege of being able to associate with find people like this. So um, there's, there, there's no other way to describe it except that if you get the opportunity or you get the invitation to participate in the job, then be the best you can be, be learnable. Take, learn something every day from whether it's your first day in or your first day out the door um, and taking care of yourself so that you can pass information along as best. So uh, on behalf of the National Fallen Fire Coast Foundation, um, I deeply want to say a, a thank you to all of you, Chief D, Sarah, Frank, for everything you're doing every day to get firefighters home to their families so they can enjoy the kids, the grandkids. And I, I even want to say, make a pitch for the great grandkids uh, because that, that, you know, that truly shows the extension of life and, and how much you will have benefited from what other people have, have passed on to you. Um, and then last but not least, Billy, um, 
you're the catalyst. You're the, you're the person that kind of pulls all of these different people together that have so much information to share and be good to everybody. And um, we, we owe a deep gratitude to you for being the, 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 the energy that you are for making this all happen. So, Very kind, John. Let me, let me just add one more thing that, that we should have mentioned at the beginning. Many of you have signed on today. Uh, we're perhaps hoping to hear from our friend Paul Combs. Uh, Paul uh, was supposed to join us. Uh, he had a, um, a personal emergency to deal with. He's fine, uh, but he was unable to join us. We'll have Paul back on another time. I, I just I didn't mean to interrupt you, John, but I did want to mention that. No, I think that's great. And I, I think that's a nice um, way to say that this is not a one and done. <clears throat> In the same way that Chief D is perpetuating the memory of Joey and Frank is working hard every day to um, keep firefighters healthy and Sarah is, is appealing to the size of the, of the of life that we never they felt as the firefighters. Uh, I think it's it's very critical to, to let her know that we're 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 going to keep this going. So um, I want to thank everybody out there for joining us today. Um, hope you took something away from it. If you didn't, you were asleep or dead. Um, and we look forward to the next uh, opportunity to provide another platform for. Uh, Chief Goldfeder to bring some of the authors out to uh, to tell a little bit more about their passing on. So everybody have a great International Book Day, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>